Welcome to the Guest X Podcast, where my co-host Brian Hamawi and I uncover the latest technologies and human-driven initiatives that are raising customer expectations and forever changing how we define customer experience across a host of industries. If you are passionate about creating incredible content and unique experiences, join us as we talk to leading product and experience experts across the globe and learn about how today's most successful brands are setting themselves apart from the competition. Welcome to another week of the Guest X podcast. I'm your co-host, Matthew Loney. I'm here with Mr. Guest Experience, Brian Hamali. I'm back in the United States, Mr. Hamali. And I, I got to tell you, I love Europe. Uh, in fact, we're going we're gonna to speak with uh, someone from over the pond today. But I got to tell you, uh, I'm happy to be back. Uh, you, you know Are what there? I miss? You know what, you know what I miss the most? And this is going to say, well... This won't surprise you because you know me really well. But when I was coming back, my wife, we're on the plane and my wife said, what are you looking forward to most? And my two answers were hot tamales because I America has America's figured out candy like and, and this are the size of our people is proof if you need anything else. But we figured out candy. <laughs> but but number two is and, and this adds to the size of our people. I miss free refills at restaurants. The sodas. I, the I know. Sodas. I, I couldn't, I, going with you to Europe and going, so in Spain, and you're asking for hot tamales and uh, bottles of sodas, like that is a very expensive endeavor, especially out there. It is. Um, it is. Yeah. Did you know that in France it is actually now illegal to offer free refills? But what surprises me in walking around France, though, is there, there's a ton of people still smoking. So I'm mm -hmm. quite, there's a little bit, you know, uh, well, a, a little bit they of walk. a hypocrisy there. No, they, they walk, they do exercise. They'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good. It's good to see you. And uh, I'm excited. You know, we're kind of on a little bit of a theme, which is a theme that I'm, uh, I think is very timely right now. We've done a couple of, of really cool interviews and today is going to be, you know, along this kind of book direct movement. We've talked about content in that space, um, I think, and um, talked a couple about a couple of different aspects about it. But why don't you uh, give our guest today an intro and uh, let's let's jump into it. Yeah, I think today's guest, most people are going to know him in the industry, um, Mark Simpson. He's the founder of Boostly, a platform designed to help owners and professionals get tactics, tools, knowledge, and confidence to increase direct bookings. Mark is one of the top 20 most influential people in the vacation rental industry. I listen to him all the time. I'm sure most of our listeners do too, and I'm really excited to have him on today. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for that lovely, lovely welcome. I am nodding along as well to the uh, what you get in Europe or what you don't get in Europe and what you get in America uh, situation. I can I can one hundred percent vouch for everything you've just said there, Matthew. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I uh, I was definitely healthier there, but I, I'm not sure that I was happier. <laughs> you did. Is, the, the two are not directly. Huh? So it's ironic. To me, it's ironic, this whole thing, because you're an athlete. And I don't know how many people actually know this, but you were you were a pretty stellar athlete in going through college and high school, right? I, I was so I could I could. Yes, I, I could hold my own. Oh, and I yeah. still am. I'm still a big runner, but people misunderstand. I run so that I can do whatever I want. Like I don't run and eat salads. If I don't run, I eat a salad. But if I run... I eat hot tamales. I drink Coke Zero, like by the truckloads, and mm -hmm. that's my right because I ran. So, like, some people are just naturally healthy. Um, that that is not a. It's not a choice of mine. It's just, uh, yeah. So you, you don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> I make the mistake. I stopped exercising. And I'm still eating the candy. Yeah, so. yeah. It's <laughs> actually the weekend, so I'll be adding some drinks to that there mix as well. There you yeah, go. I, there I, you go. I am. I am along that. I I only drink like alcohol on a day that starts with an S. So I'm the weekend I'm a weekend drinker. Yep. But uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm glad that we met. I met somebody else who has that. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm a fan. Listen to the podcast. Um, we've made connections with people on the podcast. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to digging into it. And thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thrilled, we're thrilled to have you. And I know, um, why don't you give, I, I think, and I'm going to steal by Brian usually, but it does it. But what, 
I think it would be helpful, especially on this side of the pond, Mark, where you're relatively, I would say about maybe a year ago, I started really seeing you pop up a lot over here, just in like, you know, LinkedIn and on some of the social media sites and, and, and podcasts and things like that. So give, give everybody a little bit of background and, and kind of what you're doing now. And then I, I think we'd love to dive into it and get some advice from you on, on this book direct movement. Yeah, ab absolutely. And yeah, ab very fair. It's only really the last year, I would say that um, I've had my sort of Beatles in America moment. <laughs> it's it's definitely sort of been this side of the pond for, for sure. But my background is I grew up on a 200 acre farm in, in the UK, um, in the Northeast, a little town called Scarborough, very popular touristy destination. But uh, my parents in the 90s had the had the brave bravery really to sort of switch up a 200 acre farm, uh, knock down one of the barns and put in um, a four bedroom guest house. This was at the, the the sort of the heat of the foot and mouth crisis over here and farms were going out of business left, right and center. So they had the sort of the hindsight, the sort of foresight to give it a go. And it worked really well because now you can go to any farm in Europe and it pretty much got some form of accommodation aspect to it. Back in the nineties, this was so rare and the first mover syndrome. And, um, I was just so used to every single day walking into my kitchen and having a stranger in it. That's just was my life, you know, growing up, uh, growing up as, as a teenager. And these four bedrooms quickly turned into 14 because it got very popular. This was before the days of, you know, Airbnb, booking.com, social media. They had to do everything as word of mouth uh, and um, newspaper ads, and magazine ads. So it was really sort of, um, you know, before the times of anything online, really. And it, it worked, you know, and I earn my pocket money by changing bunk beds, serving breakfast, going off to school. And um, I got to sort of late teens and I just wanted to do one thing and one thing only. And that was to play soccer. Uh, I wanted to be play for Liverpool. Liverpool's my team. <laughs> uh, there's just one problem. I'm crap at playing football. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, I quickly fell into coaching, got my badges and had an amazing opportunity to come to America. Um, so from 2002 to 2008, I was traveling every year, got my H1 visa, spent five to six months in America, uh, traveled to pretty much every state, had an amazing time, came back to the UK, worked in the parents' guest house. Um, but then in 2009, moved to London, met my wife, 2011, uh, moved back to the family business. So by this point, they had the business for 25 years and they were at an age where they wanted to, to start to think about retiring. And um, they had everything still offline. It was all pen and paper. It was a lot of tipex, <laughs> you know. It was it was, uh, but really popular. Like that's the thing. It, it had grown even more, and they had plans to put in holiday uh, holiday cottages. So me and my wife came in, and for like the four years, it was our role to sort of get them online. Uh, the, the goal at the end was to add a zero to the valuation so they can sell it and retire happily to the beach in Scarborough. But in in that time, we just basically because I grew up with one of these. I grew up with like you know, social media and whatnot and, and, you know, Facebook and all of that. So as a dab hand, I knew, I knew how to use it. And I sort of just really quickly learned email marketing, social media marketing, Google marketing, all, all that jazz. And I put it into the business and we were able to grow this offline business online. We're a top three on TripAdvisor in our area, which was great. Most followed social media page on Facebook, independent business, which was insane. And it was about 2016, 2017, I read a book by Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Workweek. I don't know if you've ever had that in your lives yet. Yes, <laughs> so it's a great book. A great book. And I quickly learned the, you know, but you didn't have to do everything yourself. It was a madness. I was like, hang on a second. So very quickly was able to sort of clockwork my way out of uh, the family business. And I used that spare time to start to go to tourism meetings because I've was just so stuck in our bubble. I never really knew of a host. So I went to these meetings and it was a very common theme, even in 2016, 2017, where the host, bed and breakfast host, rental accommodation, whatever you want to call they were doing, they were fed up with having to rely on booking.com. Airbnb was starting to grow, but Expedia, Expedia and booking.com were the big two. And I just asked a very naive question. What are you doing to bring in your own bookings, direct bookings? And they looked at me with a blank expression because <laughs> they you know, they hadn't really used social media before. They'd never had to use it for whatever reason, because people were still rocking up to the coast and just walking on the street, looking for accommodation back then, <laughs> you know, and, and that's very quickly dying out now. But so I just, um, I just started to sort of got to know people. And I said, listen, I can show you, I'm more than happy. You know, anybody wants to come up to the farm one night, um, you know, after, after we finished our uh, evening meals, I'll, I'll show you. And five people put their hand up. And that was the first ever five people I sort of showed um, how to get direct bookings to. 
Um, and then from there, I just created a Facebook group. Every single day I was putting advice in. I was asking the tourism board, like, what are you doing to help? And nobody was doing anything because it cost money. It was a funding issue. So I thought, I'll do it. And, you know, everybody started to come in. It was only meant to be for our local area. But over time, when because it was working, we had people from London wanting to join and Scotland and then people from France and Belgium and Holland and Spain. And then before I knew it, people from Australia and America were asking to come and join. And it was about 2018. I was like, I was getting messages every single day. And I was like, well, this, I can, I can turn this into something. This is a community of sorts. So I, I created Boostly and that was six years ago. And, and, you know, the last six years we have just um, developed, grown, started a podcast, <laughs> you know, it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And really the kickoff point was the pandemic, March, 2020. Um, that was really where I'd say Boostly just went to another level and direct bookings went to another level because everybody's known what a direct booking is, but so many people have always been so reliant on, Airbnb to bring their bookings in, especially in America. And um, when the world started to shut down, when Airbnb canceled all those bookings, <laughs> doesn't matter what your policy was, there was a lot of hosts who were in Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups going, what do I do now? You know, they're literally building their house on someone else's land. And it was just right place, right time. I had about 400 episodes of my podcast then, the hospitality community, we do websites and people just started, I, I became the go-to and people just started to come to us, come to us, come to us. And Fast forward to 2022, I released my first book this year called The Book Direct Playbook, which went bestseller on Amazon, which was amazing. And that's really where like now the exposure in America was so much so I was last month or this month uh, in Nashville uh, speaking at the STR Wealth event um, in front of a thousand people and 60% of the room didn't have a clue who I was. But by the end of it, direct bookings and whatnot. And since then, so many people have just come up to me and message me and stuff. And yeah, it's, it's been a crazy sort of run and ride. And we've now got over 2000 clients, which is crazy. And we've got 33 members of staff at Boostly doing websites and all of the things and it's growing and expanding. And here I am. So thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And yeah, looking forward to digging in. Wow. Congratulations. That's a, that's a hell of a story. You know, as <laughs> I'm starting to listen to you and, and I, when I first started my first property management company, we actually, my first endeavor with vacation rentals was purchasing a couple of homes here in the Orlando market with my dad in 2000. And we didn't have PRBO, we didn't have Airbnb, we didn't have any of this kind of stuff. So we actually had to figure out how to get direct bookings. And it felt like people had to put in the work. If they wanted to be successful booking out their homes, they had to figure out a way to get to customers, bring them in, entice them into the homes and get them to book. And then a few years later, we had VRBO, you know, rose. So we had this fantastic marketing platform that would get us a bunch of eyes. Airbnb came in and it just went explosive. And in the interim, and, and we're a unique industry here in the, in the central Florida market because we've got tour operators, which also brings us thousands and thousands of guests without us having to do anything. We literally just reach out to these tour operators. And if you have 50 homes, you can book all 50 homes for the entire 52 weeks in a matter of an hour. And then COVID hit. And I feel like people have had to go back, regress a little bit and get back to the grind of figuring out how to get guests or good guests back in the houses. And that comes through direct bookings. Um, one of the things with, with the big OTAs is that we don't really have good control over the guests that are coming into the homes. And that's starting to, it, it's starting to have a knock-on effect on the host and then the homeowners as well. So I think full control over a di book direct movement is the way to handle your guests properly. Understand who you're trying to attract, the type of guests that you're trying to bring in. And, but most people really don't know where to start. Like you said, I mean, you can build a website, you can do social media. There, there's just so many ways. Book Direct isn't just a website. It is, you have to understand where you want to attract these people from and how to do it. Talk to us about the approach. Where should people start? How should they start? Is it on the website? Build a website first so that you can then, you know, uh, publish yourself on social media and attract those guys there? Or should you be building a website, marketing your website, and then going social media? Maybe yeah. it's no social media and only websites. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great, it's a great question. And people do get sort of um, overwhelm syndrome, hundred percent, because there's just, they look at it and there's so many um, avenues you can go down. But I think that you, you hit it, the nail on the head perfectly. We are very lucky 
in this industry that you can pretty much today start a business, take a couple of pictures on your phone, upload it to two websites and be pretty much guaranteed income because we're in, in, in an industry uh, of making memories. We're in an industry of, you know, where people love to spend money in our industry because it's them going on vacation, staycation, workation, whatever. And because of that, we're really in demand. And Airbnb, Verbo, Booking.com, they do a great job of marketing. So it's a it's a blessing in that respect because it's so easy to generate revenue. But it's a curse because when it is so easy, you become over reliant, and then you just go, oh, "It's all right. I'll just Booking.com or Verbo or Airbnb look after me, or the tour operators in, in your neck of the woods." And it was the same in our uh, part of the world as well in Scarborough. But because of that, you become reactive. Now I don't know any other industry like we do websites. Right. We do website design for, for hosts. Now, there's no web, uh, listing site in the world where I can go and put my services and I'll be guaranteed to get revenue. You know, mm-hmm. we have to be proactive. <laughs> we have to do what every other industry has to do. We have to be proactive. We have to build a brand. We have to be present. We have to, you know, market. And you're, t- you're so right, because what's happened the last couple of years is that people have realized that they have to do the marketing. And when you look at it from the outside in, and if you're starting from literally standstill, it can be overwhelming. But I think it's so simple. And it literally starts with this, which is your phone, right? You can literally go into your phone right now. You can open up your contacts. And let's say you've got a, a thousand people in your contacts. It could be friends, family members, ex coworkers, whoever it may be, people on the school run, people in your local tennis club, football club, or whatever. Um, people that know, like, love, and trust you. And all you have to do is just send a message them just asking the question, do you know anyone? So it could be, hey, Matthew, do you know anyone who's coming to the Florida area? Do you know anyone who's coming to the York area? Do you know anyone who's coming to, to here? Does anyone, you know, who needs accommodation? Is anybody coming here for an event or a wedding? Do you know anyone who needs a place to stay? If you do that every single day to 10 people in your, in your phone book, I guarantee you, you will get a booking. And I know so because when I was on stage in Nashville, I wanted to test this theory out. There's a thousand people in the room and I got everybody to text five people in their phone book. And within seven minutes, somebody did a direct booking. So it's it's super simple, but we overwhelm ourselves because we think there's so many things we need to do. We think we have to spend money on Facebook ads or Google ads, but it really can boil down to just some really simple, uh, some really simple tactics. To answer your question directly, the most important tool that everybody needs is a property management software, a PMS as it's otherwise known as, because this will become your central hub. Again, the problem with PMSs is, is that there's over 1,000 to choose from. It's ridiculous. There will be a, an element of consolidation and, you know, there will be probably the top 30 that will come out of all of this over time. But with one, um, what it means is that this will be your central hub. So you can not only connect to Airbnb, but you can connect to Verbo, Booking.com. So you're multi-channel. There's still a massive problem in America and Canada where so many people are just listed on Airbnb. And again, I went on that stage at Nashville and I, and I asked everybody to stand up if 90% of their bookings came in from Airbnb. A large amount of the room stood up and I said, congratulations, you've not got a business, you've got a job and Brian Chesky is your boss. And, you know, it got a bit of a reaction, but it's true because when you are over 90% reliant on one channel to bring in your bookings and you are so reliant, it's like if, if, if we're talking about investment, if I was to say, yeah, I've just put 90% of my portfolio into, into a, a meme coin, a doggy coin, you'd be like, you're ridiculous. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, But that's literally what people are doing. And so the best thing to start, get a property management software tool, whatever it may be, and you can do a Google search and you'll find loads of them. Just go trial one and get one set up. Uh, be multi-channel, get a payment processor, and then you start. And then that's the best, simplest way to, of how to go about it. Is that the big difference between being an individual owner and being a professional property manager is that's that initial system? Because, you know, I mean, homeowners have access to maybe one or two platforms. If you're a professional property manager, you're actually investing. That's that PMS is not cheap. It's not a cheap investment monetarily or in time. Right. But does that actually make us does that make the difference between being professional and non? I would say, I would sort of argue that that there are some really cheap options and it's all about leveling up. Every business is about leveling up. If you're at one to five properties, hospitable, which used to be sync B&B and free to book, which is more sort of Europe based, they cost very little, very little, you know, in money, money, but not in time. Well, this is the thing though, with time, if you haven't got the time, 
you've either got the time or you've got the money, right? So if you if you haven't got the money, but you've got the time, do it yourself. If you've got the time, but not the money, so if you've got the money, but not the time, then, you know, you're, you're, in, you're in an aspect where you need to go and outsource it and go to somewhere like Fiverr or Upwork.com. You can find somebody for 30 hours a, a week, quite easily under about $300, $400 a month from somewhere in the world who will do that for you, who will do those tasks. And again, the <laughs> bringing it back to Mr. Tim Ferriss, the four-hour work week taught me that. And I know because I set it up for myself. So as far as time-wise goes, it's pretty simple. And you don't, and again, I feel like it's, I feel it's like missing, miss like we, we, we build it up so much in our heads that we feel it's going to be a big, a big thing that we don't, we don't do it. But there is so many avenues and resources to go to. Hospitable, free to book. It's so easy to set up. It's so cheap. And they've got an amazing support team. That's one to five. But when you get to six properties, you level up in this game. So when you get to six, you say, right, Thank you very much, hospitable, free to book, smooth boot, sort of more cost effective ones. Now I'm going to look at the level up. That might be uplisting, hostfully, whoever that may be. And then you, you go for the next level and the next level. And when you get to 100 and it's like, wow, you, you're going. So it all depends on where you want to be. It, it boils down to two. You're either a hobbyist host or this is your business. Now, a hobbyist host, that's fine. Do one. That's absolutely perfect. But I feel like if you listen to this podcast, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're taking the time out of your day to really learn this you want this to be your main source of income in some way shape or form so that is where you really need a pms doesn't matter whether you've got one or a hundred my big thing that i see so much is i see people with 20 but still haven't got it and they're using this spider web of connecting airbnb up and i'm like wow so this is why i do what i do it's really interesting you one of the things you talk about and i do think we have a little bit of an awareness issue and I, i'm probably one of the few people who well, maybe not one of the few, but but I've I've been saying for a while that a little bit of a slowdown in our industry is not really. I don't know that that's going to be a bad thing because we have gone through a period of time here where it was just it's running so hot. Yeah, you can you can throw something up like you said with not even good photographs, right? And just throw it up, and you can rent it. And I think that that does a little bit of a disservice to how hard this, this industry really is in a, in a regular, and I, one of the things I started to see from our position is we would start to see some property managers come to us who didn't even have a website, right? Now we've been getting clients for quite a while that didn't have offices or, you know, a physical office. That's, that's kind of been a thing for a while, but when we started getting clients who are, and they would say, oh, no, 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 I just, you know, my, you know, I pushed to Airbnb, Verbo, booking a couple of, you know, maybe good regional OTAs. And, you know, one of the things I started to ask people is, what is your guest acquisition strategy? And to you, the blank looks you would get, or the common answer was, oh, well, we pushed Airbnb. I said, no, no, no. that's a distribution <laughs> strategy. What's your acquisition strategy? Why do I pick you? Why do I book with you? Why do I stay with you? And then what's your strategy for really getting that message out? When, when you've got people who have grown to a pretty significant size who can't answer those questions, that's where I step back and go, you know, it, a little bit of a resetting wouldn't, wouldn't be bad for us, um, Mark. But I think that's really what you're talking about, right, is having a, a guest acquisition strategy. 100%. Well, if, if, if you're looking to start this, grow this, scale this, and potentially sell this, anybody who's going to be purchasing you will be looking at that aspect of it. You know, you need to have that online visibility because at the end of the day, if you are, let's just say 10, 20 properties, 30 properties in, and you haven't got a website, and you're not visible in any way, shape or form, we're getting to a point now where people buy really from people they don't buy from a logo and you can be the most outgoing person or the most introverted person people literally buy products now based on the social media presence and whether you like it or not that is just the case in point and you've got to remember at the end of the day there's all these industries but we're in the hospitality industry we are literally welcoming strangers into our house or our properties and people want to stay with you. And the reason why they want to stay with you and not go to say insert chain hotel is because they want to live like the locals. They want that local experience and you've got to be able to provide that. And there's so many stories of people that have been hospitable, show up on social media, provide an amazing guest experience. And 
they just consistently, consistently get guests coming back and they repeat book direct. And you're right. There's so many people that I see that come, come into my world and they come into my world from all niches of hospitality, all from all over the world, all different age groups. And I'll go and look at their social media and I'll go look at their LinkedIn or go look at their Instagram or their Facebook. And the amount of people who say book with me, and then they're driving people to their Airbnb listing. I'm like, wow, you are literally doing the marketing for yeah. <laughs> you're doing you're doing the marketing and then you're paying the commission and then all of the rules is on their policy. So it's like, wow. Yeah. So this, this is why I do it. I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission. I want to help 1 million hosts cut down on their over-reliance on the OTA. So that's literally the mission that I'm going on because the reason being is that I um, got to know somebody at booking.com quite well. And I, I said to him, listen, <laughs> I totally understand that if there's a guest booking at my property and they've never been to Scarborough, they don't know who I am. They don't know anybody else who has been to Scarborough. Realistically, they're not going to book with me direct the first time because booking.com take up that real estate on social, on, on Google, et cetera. But if they have a good guest experience, I should have every opportunity to market to that guest to rebook with me direct next time. And the guy at booking.com said, yeah, hundred percent right, Mark. But he said, hosts don't want to do that. Hosts don't know how to do that. And I was like, huh, okay. So that's something. And then I listened to Brian Chesky on a podcast last year when he was doing the, um, the IPO run and he did it on the Sway podcast. And she asked a fantastic question about, do you believe that your host should be able to take direct bookings? And he just said, nah, they don't want to. They don't care about that. I was like, okay. So this needs to be done because you, I need to now educate hosts because we aren't treated as partners. Like they don't treat us like partners. We're just numbers. They say partners, but it's anything but. To get their attention, we need to not only educate the host, but we need to host and then educate their guests. The amount of websites that I go on and they haven't got a, this is why you should book direct section of their website is amazing to me. When we do that, when we can help educate 1 million hosts and they can educate their guests, then that's when we get their attention. And this is why it's so important to do. This is why I come on podcast webinars and do all of the things, because if, if, if we can do this right, then we'll get the attention. Because the fear is there's a stat going around that by 2030, 80% of all bookings will be via an OTA, which is scary to me because I released, and I always use the Amazon example. I released my book this year and I had to, had to put it on Amazon. I couldn't do it direct. I had to put it on Amazon. And whenever I sell a book on Amazon, they take 66% of every book sale. Six of sinks. And we are stressing at the moment at 15% with booking.com, 14% with Airbnb. But if they go this route and if they're doing 80% of the bookings, there's no, nothing to stop them in 2030 if they achieve this goal of coming to us, the host, and say, you know, this relationship that we've got, you know, we're driving so many bookings. I don't think this 15% is fair. Let's knock that up to 20. And then they'll go, mm -hmm. well, 20, let's turn that to 30. Actually, I think this is a 50 50 relationship here. So <laughs> that is when it becomes a bit of a, a, a st sticky point. Because Airbnb want to be the Amazon of this hospitality world, 100%. You can see what they're doing. They've caught with booking.com. So this is why it's important to do it. So this is why we've got to make a start now. I think it's at the basics, right? If people really understood the, the, um, the intention um, behind the big OTAs. I mean, when I think about an OTA, for me, from a business perspective, I think of them as a marketing channel. I'm not thinking of them as a partner. And if you think about them as a marketing partner, what your intention is, is to get in front of as many eyes as you possibly can, bring them into a home, and then do your direct marketing strategy. That is the intention. And I think that's where most people miss the mark, don't understand how to do it, or just don't have a strategy to do that. And I say this a lot, which is we just don't have the tools I mean, you're one of the very few people in this industry that actually wants to teach people how to do that. But we talk about education a lot. Part of the education is to understand the role of the OTA and then how to bring the guest into the house. And I, I did a speech actually in, in London at one of the conferences with Verma. And it was specifically about that, the direct booking uh, strategy. And it's use your OTA as a marketing platform. You can't beat them, join them get your guest into the house and then retarget, create a retargeting strategy. Yeah. And that yeah. is the most cost effective way to do this, right? You are paying literally 15% for the first booking or 18%, which is pretty close to the marketing spend you should have on your direct bookings either way. You get the guest in the house and then guess what? Your next cheapest way to market to the guest is direct. Mm -hmm. 100%. 
couldn't have said it better myself. Like that is a- exactly right. And and this is the thing when you get somebody into your house and they're in your house, like Amazon would kill for that level of advertising. That's why I've put in Alexa devices literally in every appliance possible because they want to be able to advertise and market at all times. When somebody's in your property, it still baffles me to the day that there isn't more signs or logos of the actual company in the property. Like we identified two t- key touch points in our properties. It was the front door and it was the fridge. That's where people go to the most. And so what we did to boost our reviews, because we knew reviews was key even back in 2011. So we put a nice little sign on the back of every door. Bearing in mind, we had 14 guest rooms and we had free holiday cottages. So we had a lot of people coming through our, our farm on a, on, a, on a yearly basis. We just put, if you've had an amazing stay, um, please leave a review on TripAdvisor. We even put a QR code. This is before QR codes were even a thing. We even put like a little link to make it easy to send them to our TripAdvisor page. And we we we, we always dangled the carrot as well. So it's like we pick one review every month and that winner will, the person will win a bottle of wine or whatever. It was like the incentive we're doing at the time. And it always worked because they see it every single time on, on the stay. We didn't wait until they got home. We did it while they were on the state and they were like, oh yeah, absolutely. I'll leave a review. We have an amazing time. And we did it because we asked, we did it. And it still amazes me now that more and more people aren't taking advantage of the fact, like one of the easiest things everybody can do right now, while they listen to this podcast, go into all of your properties and change the Wi-Fi name and code to book direct or leave a five-star review. And so when they're grabbing the Wi-Fi and it's like, what's the Wi-Fi code? It's book direct. What's what's book direct? Or leave a five-star review. Oh, that's kind of cool and funky. It's like it, 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 it's so easy to do. And there's so many little simple things, but you're right. There's not that much education, which is why I brought out the book direct playbook this year. It gives 101 tips on, on how to get started. So yeah, trying, <laughs> trying to educate, trying to re-educate and trying to show everybody that it's not as hard as what we think it is. I think one of the things too, when, we, when I look at our industry and I know this was a, a conversation at the latest, you know, the, the skift forum, I think is what they call it. But, um, When you look at other industries, Mark, let's use the airlines, right? Or, or hotels, maybe for even a better, and you look at who's really been successful and obviously the hotels took a hit, but they fought back and they're they're. but it's been the ones who, you know, the loyalty programs have really been successful and it explored, we talk a lot about the need for a loyalty program. I think because we are a very fragmented industry, you know, maybe something that is maybe at the PMS level, something that allows groups to work from, you know, different markets with each other, but provides guests rewards. But you look at a Marriott and now getting into the industry, it's it's actually one of the reasons I believe if any of the hotels are going to be successful in having a good short-term rental or holiday rental program, it'll probably be a Marriott because their loyalty program is strong. In the U.S. with the airlines, Delta. Delta far surpasses the other airlines because their loyalty membership is very strong. Mm. What do you see, you know, when you think about what's keeping us from doing better in the book direct movement, Obviously, you know, part of it's just acknowledging why it's important and understanding it. And there's an educational piece, which you've spoken to. But what else do we need, do you think, to really be successful when you look at these other industries, whether it be tech or what have you, that's keeping us from getting to that next level? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the major problem is that everybody thinks they have to reinvent the wheel. You think that it has to be new and it doesn't. You just got to look at what those industries or those say to Marriott, do really well. Look at Marriott's website, look at Hilton's website, look at Holiday Inn, look at, and going back to the UK, look at the Premier, look at what the big chains are doing. If you go on their websites, they've got rewards for when you book direct. You know, mm-hmm. um, the Hilton Hotel, they did, had a massive campaign with uh, with a major A-list holiday uh, Hollywood movie star, and it was don't click around. That was the whole motto of it. Don't click around, come direct. And it's like, okay, so on the website, you go and the, if you book direct, you get these benefits. This is why I'm saying it's, it's madness that when I go onto anybody's website in the industry, 
whatever you're doing, whether you're a large operation or small operation, and on the first page of your website, it doesn't have a little section that says book of us direct and you get the following benefits like free Wi-Fi, late checkout, whatever that may be. Uh, so you've got to look at what the others are doing and, and put it in, into your business. Loyalty programs is a fantastic one. And it's, and it's you know, you can, you can say loyalty program or you can say community. One of the things that we did at our family business is we built a community. And I've done the same thing with Boostly. You build a community and then everything else comes on the back of it. So a community is so simple. I mean, the, the simplest way, Facebook group. If your audience, if your guests, if your avatar is 35 plus, they're spending the majority of time on, on Facebook, Facebook groups is the one. If you're going for more of the younger audience, you're going to be talking Discord or Slack. That's a total of a conversation. We created a Facebook group. We called it the Granary VIPs. That's literally it, the Granary VIPs. And we invited people in for a mail out campaign or whatever. And in that group, we just posted pictures from the local area, what was happening, things that was going on. And because there was like a group of people in there, they started calling themselves the Granary VIPs. They would recognize guests from their stay. They would interact and they would actually arrange to meet up. We built this little community within it. And that is that is the most simplest form of, of doing it. And this is what you see now with the new form of marketing that's coming in, like this web 3.0 as we go on to the next level of marketing, is that the, 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 the companies and the organizations and the products that have got a community behind it are the ones that are go going to succeed. So if you can figure that out, like amazing. I mean, look at, like you, you go back to, um, other industries, Harley Davidson, you know, they, they have tattoos of Harley Davidson's on their bodies. They've created a community around it. So it's about creating super fans. How do you create super fans? It's all about the guest experience. I think one of the things that I've learned very early on in my sort of business life is that you've got to bury yourself so far down in a niche that there's not, there's room for nobody else. And there's another quote. It's that don't try and be the best, be the only. So how do you bring that back to hospitality? You've got to really focus now on what your niche is going to be coming out of the last couple of years, whether that is that you specialize for dog friendly accommodation, whether that is you specialize for this new uh, digital nomads that are sort of a workcation, but sort of out there. Like, for example, now I see so many properties that have got a specially designated workspace. And this is what Airbnb are calling out for because they see it in their data, in their trends, that people are looking to work while traveling or traveling while working. So how can you make sure that not only you create a niche, but also as well, then once you've created this niche, how do you talk about it? And, and when you really do dial down on that, and when you get a, a, an avatar, as we call it, a customer avatar, like your ideal guest, you want to walk for your property, everything just becomes so much easier because then you'll attract the right guest. Then you'll have those those guests will then tell their friends and they'll attract them in. So if someone's coming to Columbus, Ohio, if someone's coming down to Orlando, Florida, say you've got properties spread around the States and you've got clear branding. For example, there's a, a company that we work with called Jungle House in Columbus, Ohio. Every single one of their properties is just littered with plants. And it's amazing. It's like the, it's the place with the plants. And it's instantly, when you look at their properties, you go, oh, that's Jungle House. And it's, they've built the brand around it. And it's fantastic. So it's, I think the problem is, is that, as business owners, as hospitality owners, we try and appeal to everybody. And when you appeal to everybody, you appeal to nobody. So mm -hmm. focus on what your niche is, whatever that may be, and really dial down on it and create your culture, your community around that. And your life will be so much easier moving forward. So what I'm hearing is you have to understand your brand to be able to execute. And, and I think that's the very first step. Where do you, what is your company? Why did you start this company? What's your message? That message needs to be delivered very clearly everywhere you post, whether it's a website, Airbnb, VRBO, people need to get to know your brand uh, and your product, right? That in turn is going to create scalability, right? Um, so one of the, the tough issues or one of the tough things to do in saturated markets is to differ differentiate yourself between one company and another. In Orlando, we have something like 700 property managers. Yeah. And it's near impossible to be to say, well, I'm, I'm so much different from the guy next door because I market on Airbnb. Well, everybody markets on Airbnb. And, and I think if you can actually narrow down what your product is, because essentially we are a product amongst many products, yeah. um, then that translates into homeowner acquisition. Does that... Is that how you see that that exercise working as well? Yeah. And or is homeowner acquisition through um, acquisitions? Well, I, I take the example of Orlando and I can bring it straight back to my hometown. There's a there's a street in, in our hometown of Scarborough where it's called Columbus Ravine. And every single 
house on that street is a bed and breakfast, is a hotel in some way, shape or form. And you can very much argue that is a very saturated street. But what I say to everybody is that you've got, you could have 10 houses in a row, all doing the same thing, all bed and breakfast. You could go to Ikea or wherever and get all the same furniture. But the thing that separates you from the person next door is you. It's, it's mm-hmm. like, it's, it's your presence. It's how you act. It's how you build your business. It's how you build your, your culture. You know, it's the people that you hire. Because people buy from people at the end of the day. And it could, it'll, it'll boil down to how your personality, how you present yourselves, how you talk online, how you show up online. That'll be how you different yourself from everybody. And if you've got a niche around it and you can build a community around it, it doesn't matter whether there's 700 or 1,000 or 2,000. People will literally come back and stay with you and your property and your business and your brand because of you and your culture. And, and, and that's an, an amazing way of getting around saturation. I love it. Yeah, there's we could speak for hours and hours and hours on all of these topics. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, we could. I, I was just thinking if we could do three or four episodes just on on each of these topics. You know, Bar, we had a guest. Brian, was it your brother? Brian's brother now works with Chip Conley, who is head of glo- yeah. uh, I don't know, was he global development or something for Airbnb? But I mean, he's yeah. just I mean, he's a he's a brand and marketing genius, but, but, um, Brian's brother is, is equally in that realm, but he, he said something that was jumping out at to me following the lines of what you just said, but he said, build community and commerce will follow. Mm, And he used, you know, he used like Peloton and all these groups. And the other thing he said, I think, I think it was your brother, but he said, you know, you sell them what, they, you, know, you you may sell them what they think they need, but they'll stay because of the community. And he mm-hmm. used, I think it was Peloton, where it was like people might buy a Peloton because they think they need to lose weight or they need to get into shape or whatever their goal is, right? That's kind of a little bit, I would call it superficial. Mm-hmm. But then when you talk to them a year later, why they're still doing Peloton when they've hit that ideal weight or whatever it is, is because they've built a community inside mm-hmm. of Peloton and obviously Peloton's taken their hits you know, since they've gone public, but it doesn't, I don't think anyone would argue Peloton is, it, it's been that's, an incredible community. But that's why Airbnb rose the way it did because it yes. wasn't, and, and you had Airbnb, you had, I mean, VRBO, you had Expedia, you had other channels in the marketplace that were doing the, the exact same thing that Airbnb is doing. We have 200 other companies, but the success around Airbnb was the local feel and it was the community it was the host it was the positioning they understood the brand and the type of customer that they were attracting it was a younger generation to begin with and it was the individuality of the homes and the proposition that we as a community were providing something that was unique which is how your airbnb excelled above all other platforms but when you dig down deep and one of the things that mark said earlier on is keep it simple. Don't reinvent the wheel. Airbnb did not reinvent the wheel. All they did was they took a product, they found their niche, they found their voice, and they launched it. And they did phenomenal doing that. But they haven't reinvented anything for us. No, they, they, they took advantage of booking holiday group and they took advantage of Expedia taking that eye off the ball and they absolutely run with it because now they've created their own name. No one says I'm staying at a Verbo. They say, I'm staying at an Airbnb. No yep. one, you know, they've created their own name. So they've done that. And they've, I think their first goal was to catch up with bookings and um, Expedia, which I, I could argue that they've done. And now they're going to look to overtake it. But this is why it's important. And I think like the, the big misconception of what I talk about, people say, oh, so you're saying I got to delete my Airbnb account. I'm saying, no, you don't do that. 100%. It's as dangerous going Absolutely 100% not. book direct. It's, a, it's, as, it's as dangerous going 100% book direct as it is being reliant yep. on the OTAs. You've got to have that balance. My goal is to make sure everybody is at least 65% um, book direct with the other 35% spread around the other channels. My big problem at the moment is it's too outweighed in the other, in the other favor that 70% plus are reliant on one platform to bring in their bookings. And so, yeah, that's, that, that is it. And we, we have to sort of not reinvent the wheel, keep it simple, um, but find what your niche is and just double down on it. And that's how you're going to win coming into 2022, 2023. 
That's I awesome. love it. Yeah. And, uh, huh. you know, it, it, people don't realize, and we may end on this, but you know, that Airbnb, this applies to the big brands as well, too. By the way, for those of you listening, you, the fear in Expedia or Verbo or Booking.com of what Google is doing, I guarantee you is much deeper in those buildings than it is, not that it's not a fear, but then it is at Airbnb because Airbnb can say, X percentage, which is, you know, I don't know the latest I saw, but I think it was double or triple, like of people who come to Airbnb, they type in airbnb.com, where you look at Verbo in particular, they're getting there by clicking on an ad, they first search Google, well, if Google shuts you out, so they've got their own little version of book direct. And again, Airbnb's winning that war, but it's also why they're worth more, I think because mm -hmm. they don't have to rely upon Google to serve up their ads where some of these big other OTAs, it really is. It's like, if they shut off that spigot, they're going to struggle because people don't remember where they book through when they stayed at Verbo, but people who booked through Airbnb go, Oh no, we, we booked with Airbnb. A lot of them think they stayed with Airbnb. Yeah, and that's, oh, yeah. that is right. Yeah. Absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah, even people at Verbo have a hard time not saying Airbnb. Yeah, I think uh, you got to. Right. I think you definitely got to watch for the Google Play this year. I've you yeah, can feel it. It's coming, and yeah, you're hundred hundred and ten percent right. I think they they stopped. Um, Expedia said in one of their earnings calls that they stopped doing all SEO because, and instead they they put all that money. This is why there's no there's no like there's no you can join the dots. They've done so much TV ads. They've done all of that. You know they've got John Legend and his wife yeah. to do all the TV yep. ads. They did that huge campaign. So yeah, then they're worried. And yeah, you're just waiting for that Google play. But uh, I'm, I'm for one watching and just sort of seeing what goes on and just, uh, yeah, at the same time, just keep sort of banging that book direct button. That's great. Hey, Mark, if people want to get a hold of you, I'm guessing just, you know, the website email, but what's the, what's the best way? Yeah, Instagram. Instagram is my jam. So at Boostly UK, it's literally on my chest if you want to see what that is. Or oh, if you want to connect LinkedIn, just type in Mark Simpson. Um, just type in Mark Simpson Boostly on LinkedIn. Come and say hi. Let, let us know you came from the podcast. That'd be awesome. I love it when people reach out when I go on podcasts, say, hi, I heard you on XX podcast. That's awesome. So come and say hi. I have Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, come and say hi and, and have a chat. And if they want to buy your book? So the book, uh, type in book direct playbook, uh, on, on Amazon and you can, you can find it. it's on audible Kindle print version. Um, so yeah, please go and check that out. It's literally 99 cents. So <laughs> it's, it's not a bad, somebody came to me, sent me a message this week saying that just generated in the last two weeks, $26,000 worth of direct bookings on the back of that book. So Wow, um, that's a pretty decent return of it. It's a good, yeah, it's a good, that's a good ROI yeah. right there. On that's not a bad, cent. that's not a bad ROI. Yeah, it's not a bad. Mark, ROI. Mark thank <laughs> you so much. We know you're really busy, and just really appreciate the time today. That's it for this week's episode of Guest X. Be sure to sign up for our email list at guestxpodcast.com. That's guest the letter X podcast.com, and follow us on your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss our next episode. We are Mister Guest Experience Brian Hamawi and Matthew Loney signing off and reminding you to always create a customer experience worth talking about. This podcast is a hospitality.fm production.